we have arrived to our match early enough to properly check the court, the net, the playable and non-playable areas, and everything covered in rules one, two, and three. Let's now place our focus on player equipment and uniform. This is covered under rule four. Prior to the match, head coaches shall verify with the first referee that all their players are legal and wearing legal uniforms and equipment. This is typically done with a verbal yes when asked by the first referee during the captain's meeting, which takes place about 20 minutes before match time. However, we need to be looking at players, their uniforms, and any additional equipment they might be wearing for legality the moment we walk into the gym. By doing so, we can address any questions we may have about uniform, equipment, and accessories to a player's coach, allowing them ample time to make corrections. Articles 1 through 8 of Section 1 provides us with a not necessarily all-inclusive list of things we may or may not see on a player. It also lists the penalties for any violations. A guard, cast, or brace, which is considered an unyielding item, shall not be worn on the hand, finger, wrist, or forearm, even though it may be covered with soft padding. If it's on the elbow, upper arm, or shoulder, it shall be padded and is legal, provided does not extend more than halfway down the forearm. We commonly see ankle braces and knee braces on players these days. If these items are unaltered from their original design, they are legal and do not require any additional padding. If, however, we see that one of these items has been altered, we need to determine if it's a danger to other players. There's a new rule covered by Rule 4. It's in Section 1, Article 4. It states that a protective face mask made of a hard material may be worn by a player, provided it is molded to the face. If you're unfamiliar with a device such as this, perhaps you've seen it on a basketball player that has suffered a facial injury in the past. Now that they're back to playing, to protect that injury, they're allowed to wear a face guard that covers their eyes and their nose. In the past, a device such as this required an authorization from the BHSL. Obviously, that's no longer the case. The last few articles in Section 1 cover hair devices and jewelry. In regards to hair devices, we've started to look the other way and not enforce this rule since over the past few seasons, more and more items are allowed to be worn in the hair legally. Let's do our due diligence and know this rule. Hair devices made of a soft material and no more than three inches wide can be worn in the hair or the head. This covers the cloth headbands or perhaps a bandana that's folded and used as a tie back. I have seen players attempt to wear a bandana in the full triangular fashion and that's not legal. Bobby pins, flat clips, flat berets, unadorned, meaning there's no dangly ribbons or bows attached to them and that the fact that they're no longer than two inches are legal. Interestingly, the United States Association of Volleyball permitted jewelry to be worn by players this past season. That is not the case under Federation rules. Jewelry shall not be worn by players during warm-ups or competition. However, there are a couple exceptions to this jewelry rule. The first is a medical alert medal. This is not considered jewelry and it shall be taped to the body, but it can be visible. The other exception is religious medals, also not considered jewelry, but they should be worn under the uniform and taped to the body. Lastly, players should not wear any body paint or glitter on their face, hair, uniform, or body. So what do we do when we see a player with jewelry or illegal equipment? Well, we have some penalties at our disposal, but something that we need to consider is when we make this discovery. If we discover a player wearing jewelry during the time warm-up period, we can simply direct the player to remove the jewelry so that they can continue. The best course of action here is to do this through the player's coach. Put the onus of that responsibility on them. Now, if a player refuses to remove the jewelry or does not comply with that direction, then we can charge them with unsporting conduct by way of a yellow card. 
This will be issued after the R2 has checked lineups and before the beckon of the first serve of the first set. Once play begins and we discover a player wearing jewelry or wearing illegal equipment, we must handle that situation differently. We have a couple different scenarios here. If the jewelry is on a player that's already on the court, then we must address that player immediately and have them quickly rectify the illegal equipment. If they can do so in a timely manner without delaying the match, then we continue and there's no problem. If they are not able to rectify the problem, such as not able to get an earring out, then they must be removed from the court via legal substitution or libro exchange. The next scenario would be a substitute attempting to enter the set. The player cannot enter the set until the illegal equipment is removed or made legal. Again, if they could do this quickly, then we will allow the substitution. Otherwise, we would have to deny that substitution. As referees, we have a little discretion here. If once discovered, a player can make themselves legal immediately, we can continue play. However, if we have to take the player off the court or have to deny a substitution, then we must administer a team delay. We do this with an administrative yellow card for the first offense and an administrative red card for a subsequent offense. Let's move on to Section 2 of Rule 4 and discuss legal uniforms. There is a myriad of articles and sub-articles in this section we need to be very familiar with. Once we walk into the gym and start checking the net and the court, we need to be checking uniforms as well, especially during the captain's meeting and timed warm-ups. If we can do some preventative officiating here, we can avoid any delays during the course of the match regarding uniforms. The last thing we want is to see an illegal uniform while the teams line up for announcements and the national anthem. To begin, and to reiterate a uniform rule change from last year, all uniform tops, with the exception of the Libro, of course, shall be like colored, and uniform bottoms shall be light colored. In the past, that rule only pertained to uniform bottoms and not the tops. Now, if a player is wearing a dark blue top and the rest of the team is wearing, let's say, black, then that is legal. Same as for uniform bottoms. If one player is wearing navy blue bottoms and the rest of the team wearing black, that is also legal. Subarticles D through G of Article 1 discuss manufacturer's logo, school insignias, the American flag, and any commemorative memorial patches that can be displayed on uniform bottoms or tops. The biggest part of these subsections are the measurements. We are not the ruler police. We need to familiarize ourselves with these measurements and be able to determine with the naked eye whether they're legal or not. We certainly do not want to be pulling out a ruler, going up to a young player, and trying to measure the size and dimensions of a logo on their compression shorts. The last two subsections of Article 1 reference how the uniform top and uniform bottom should be properly worn. In regards to the uniform top, bare midriffs are not allowed. We don't often see jerseys that show someone's stomach. However, often I do see players hike their shirt up prior to service or while they're warming up. This cannot be allowed. Remember, these are still high school players. The uniform top shall hang below or be tucked into the waistband of the uniform bottom when the player is standing upright. In regards to any garments underneath a jersey, that garment should be unadorned and of a solid single color and it should be similar in color to the predominant color of the uniform top. Here again, this is something I often see and that we do not enforce. For instance, if a player is wearing a white jersey, they may have a purple undergarment that can be seen by the referee. This has to be addressed. It either has to be removed or changed to match the dominant color of the jersey. We often don't give too much thought about a team's uniform bottom because we're more worried about the team's jersey. In any case, know that the uniform bottom can be light colored, but it can also be of multiple styles on the same team. For instance, one player might be wearing spandex where another player might be wearing shorts. This is completely legal. 
One area where we need to pay much more attention to in regards to the uniform bottom are visible undergarments. It's becoming more and more common, especially in the boys game, where players either are wearing compression shorts or even compression leggings that extend far below the uniform bottom. Once again, these leggings or shorts must be of a single solid color that is similar to, to the predominant color of the uniform bottom. If we have players on the same team wearing different colored leggings or compression shorts that are visible, this must be addressed. It is not allowed. They either need to correct it or change. As we check uniforms, we also need to check the Libros jersey. It must clearly contrast from the predominant color of a team's uniform top, excluding the trim. A team's predominant color in their jersey can be that of a solid color, or if they have a multiple color jersey, it is a color that is most visibly seen. In some cases, we might have a 50-50 jersey where half the jersey is red and half the jersey is blue. In this case, both of those colors are predominant, and therefore the Libro jersey cannot be either one of those colors. Remember, it must clearly contrast. That is the main rule here. When checking uniforms, we should also be checking that each player is identified by a unique number on their jersey. Some quick points about uniform numbers. First, the numbers should be permanent and clearly visible. Federation rules do not allow numbers to be put on jerseys by marker or with tape. The numbers are, should be between 0 and 99. There is no double zero in Federation rules. Numbers displayed on jerseys should be plain Arabic numerals. They should be made of a solid color or of what we call a bordered number, either of which must clearly contrast with the main colors of the player's jersey. Something to note, beginning July 1st of 2023, the body of the number, that's the solid part, must clearly contrast from the body of the uniform regardless if it's a bordered or trim number. There are lots of measurements when it comes to the size of numbers and the placement of the numbers on a player's jersey. Once again, we are not the ruler police. However, we should be familiar with some of these measurements. Some measurements to note are the size of the numbers. They should be at least four inches tall on the front and at least six inches tall on the back of the player's jersey. Where they're placed is of note as well. If they're placed in the front, they can either be on a shoulder about five inches down from the shoulder seam or about five inches centered underneath the neckline, regardless if it's a crew neck or a V-neck. If it's on the back, it should be centered. The last article regarding legal uniforms is Article 7. It states that the removal of any part of the uniform, top or bottom, while in the playing area is unsporting conduct. An example of this might be in between sets, a coach asks a player to become the libero for the next set, where they were a regular player during the first set. We see that player quickly take off their jersey and put on a contrasting jersey. This is not allowed. The player must leave the playing area and either go to a locker room or bathroom in order to change. I see this often, but I don't see referees enforce this rule. It's unsporting conduct, and it should be assessed to the coach. It's a yellow card for the first offense and a red card for any subsequent offenses. There are, of course, penalties when players are wearing illegal uniforms. Whether a player is wearing an illegal uniform attempting to enter the set, such as the case of a substitution, or if a player is discovered wearing an illegal uniform during the course of a set, already on the court, the penalties are similar. We assess an unnecessary delay. In the case of a substitution, we deny that substitution, and they cannot enter until the uniform is replaced or made legal. With a player on the court, that player must be removed until the uniform is replaced or immediately made legal, and they can take a timeout in order to make that happen. Lastly, if we have a team that cannot begin a match with six players wearing legal uniforms, we assess a loss of rally or point to the opponent. 
at the beginning of the match and we let them play. Make sure you call Mary after this happens.